If we run, they're gonna kill us. We're in an open field. If we stop and surrender, we're gonna be taken, probably killed anyway. We don't have comms to reach back to our unit and say, hey, I just got in trouble, come and help me. Probably about 20 to 30 of them. Felt like the only option was just turning and fight. My name is Chad Robichaud, former Fourth Street Combat Marine and founder of Mighty Oaks Foundation. From the age of about 15 till 17, I was living alone, trying to work and go to high school. I went to Marine Corps boot camp, graduated in infantry school, went to 29 Palms, California, and pursued my dream that first year I tried out to be a reconnaissance Marine, making it eventually to Force Recon. Marine Recon units are the eyes and ears of the Marine Corps. One of the smaller special operations units, they'll do anti-pirating, hostage rescue, and go in behind enemy lines and conduct reconnaissance missions. And there'll be three companies of recon Marines, and the fourth company is the Force Recon Company in the top 25%. I remember when those planes flew into World Trade Center buildings. I was a sergeant at Third Force Recon Company at that time. I was the military freefall team leader. Everyone was like, hey, what's up, sir? Like, let's make this right. We will not waver. We will not tire. We will not falter. And we will not fail. I got the opportunity after that to try out for the Joint Special Operations Command Task Force. It was one of six Marines that had the privilege of serving with the premier special operations unit in the world. All eight of my deployments, I worked in the capacity of a AFO, Advanced Force Operator. You imagine a assault force your tier one special operations unit, Delta Force or SEAL Team 6, going on a target to capture or kill someone in the top 10 terrorist list. That assault force typically is relying on infrastructure, vehicles, permits, and passes to be able to access certain areas. Safe houses, equipment, all the contingencies that go in place if something bad happens on target and they have to be able to egress on foot. AFOs usually work at those two units and go ahead of those assault forces trained to go and make those things happen. When you're at AFO, you don't want to get in gunfights. You want to create reasons that no one would ever pay any mind to you. That means living, working, and embedding with local nationals. No one's coming to get you. We don't have comms to reach back to our unit and say, hey, I just got in trouble, come and help me. You can't do it by yourself. We have to rely on local nationals to be able to function and operate in those environments. It's a 24-7 job. Aziz and I worked together for eight deployments. He was street smart, highly vetted, and trained to work with us. We spent days, weeks, months together at times, just the two of us, in the mountains of Afghanistan, across the border into Pakistan, in very non-permissive environments where other military was not around. And so Aziz was not only my interpreter, but he was my teammate. And he ultimately became my friend. When I was six, I went out one day, kids were playing. Suddenly, I heard a very big boom. And I was covered with the dust, fragmentations on my face, on my fingers. I found out most of my buddies passed away. That was the first lesson for me that although this world is so beautiful, we are not permanent over here. I found me some books called Self-Learning English. And I was practicing on the streets of Kabul and I started an English course. I trained about 800 students in English language, Afghan literature, basic mathematics. The Taliban take over the country for the first time back in the 90s. The Taliban made new roles. They saw me lecturing English and they came to the classroom. They wanted to take me to the jail. At that time, if the Taliban takes you to jail, you're young, you have no beard, and you know, guess what? You are done with your life. I jumped from the second floor. I ran away from them. Twin Towers, uh, of course, was the- One day I noticed the 9-11 happened. And from my childhood, I had this desire, if one day I find an opportunity to help my country, I will sacrifice my life for it. I went to the Kabul Military Training Center. The United States Special Forces were there. They were actually building the Afghan National Army. I became the chief interpreter 
In 2004, I was shifted to the JSOC Special Operation. That's where I met my brother, Chad Robosho, and we did over 100 missions together in Afghanistan. He's saved my life on three occasions in combat. He probably saved my life every day though. Like, don't walk there, don't eat that. Most of the time, I would ask Chad, do not talk, because the only language he knows is English. And if he talks, we are done. And they have killed hundreds of people like that at that time. He had a heart to take care of me. Early 2006, we were in a place called Badakut, Afghanistan. The Taliban was pretty saturated in that particular area. And there was a guy on the top 10 list our command had identified was there. Aziz and I went into the area a few weeks ahead of time and started building all the pre-operation clandestine logistics to put the guys on target. It was snowy and cold. We had actually over there a few remote support sites. I had to use my Afghan network, Pakistani network to just kind of give us a coverage for this whole thing. The guys from the unit were going to jump in, rally up with us at a warehouse. We are going to have all the local national vehicles in place, roll them on target, breach the compound wall and go in and get the guy. We had parked in a wooded area. We got out and we walked across this open field. We were trying to figure out routes like an egress route that they had asked us to look at. We were walking across this open farming field. Everything's kind of dead and it's muddy, cold, windy. So we get to the other side of this open field and the old man comes up to us. He starts talking to Aziz and I couldn't understand what they were saying. He told me in Pashto language, you guys better get out of here. There is Taliban, they have intel. There is an Afghan with a foreigner in this area. They are here to kill them or kidnap them. We were shocked. I'm like, you know, that Afghan is me and that American is Chad. There is no one else in this area. Aziz is like, hey, brother, we have to leave. The Taliban's coming around and looking for a foreigner, which would have been me. This open field was just open field before. Now it's an open danger area. As timing would have it, as we were walking across, there's three Hilux pickup trucks with Taliban flags. I'm trying to not pay attention and keep walking away. And then I heard the trucks stop. I'm trying not to look back, but you can hear the reversing. That was a pretty, pretty scary feeling. We get other trucks and probably about 20 to 30 of them and they started yelling. And I couldn't understand what they were saying. We just kept walking. We were about 100 yards away, not too far away. And I heard the words Bosh, which means stop. The only thing that stopped at my time was probably my heart. Let's play like we don't hear. Just keep walking. We'll get to the tree line. We're gonna run. Aziz had an AK-47 over his shoulder. I had an AKS shoved in my backpack with some magazines in it. I asked Chad to give me the AKS because it's much lighter. And I really loved it because it takes more rounds than, than the AK so I can cover better for him. So we're doing that while we're walking and talking. I heard a gunfire, heard the crack of the round as it breaks over your head. If we run, they're gonna kill us. We're in an open field. If we stop and surrender, we're gonna be taken, probably killed anyway. Felt like the only option was just turn and fight. I turned around, caught in my peripheral like all the guys, zoned in on this one guy, fired two rounds center mass but then he fell. I expected to be in a gunfight, and they all ran on the other side of the vehicle. I just yelled the disease to move, and I continued to fire that magazine. I have right now the Smith & Wesson FPC, which is a nine millimeter folding uh, pistol carbine. We're using it today to simulate an AKS. Uh, I was carrying an AKS, uh, 5.56 caliber. Aziz had an AK-47. Uh, my AKS had a EOTech on it. Aziz felt more comfortable with me having a long gun, him having an AKS uh, with the EOTech on it. So we traded guns while we were just talking. We know the Taliban guys are behind us. When I heard that first round crack, I turned in an offhand position. Move! Moving! I yelled, move to Aziz so we could execute our Australian peel or just simply bounding. We had trained this before. We couldn't bound backwards away from them uh, because we'd have been going into continuing this open danger area. We had to move laterally and we had already talked about that. We're getting at a tree line. In that tree line was our truck. It's further than it is where we are now, but you get the picture. And so as I started emptying my magazine, I yelled, move, Aziz moved. And so I'm emptying the magazine. 
as he yells, move. Move! And I'm like, moving! Move! Aziz moved. As I emptied that magazine, I already heard Aziz shooting. And you know, I was giving him cover. They had TKMs on them. I moved past him and I got down. As I'm emptying that second magazine, Aziz is moving. During that moment when Aziz is moving, if you're doing bounding like that, when it's your time to move, somebody's covering you. You don't stop. I saw Aziz stop and I remember thinking why he stopped. I noticed this guy with the RPG. <laughs> And I didn't see it, and Aziz did. And he stopped in the middle of running, exposed himself in the open, opened the burst from the EOTech. RPG! That guy fell down, and that RPG never went off. It saved both of our lives. He kept them busy firing at them. I shot the guy, and then we ran into the woods. We got to the woods. I could still hear shooting. We got in our truck, went to our safe house. I remember being pretty shaken up. Aziz was like, this is like what we do, we stay. We finished operation and assaulters came on target. We got one of the bad guys out of the fight. My wife wouldn't have a husband, my kids wouldn't have a father if it wasn't for Aziz that day and other days. We were promoting democracy, civil rights, human rights. All the roads in Afghanistan were paved by the Americans. The Afghan educational institutions were built. Afghan found access to the internet for the first time in their life. The enemy was obvious. They were against this. I concluded that it's time to end America's longest war. In 2021, President Biden made that announcement. He was going to do a full and complete withdrawal of Afghanistan. The Taliban is now retaking towns and territories at an alarming rate. One province is handed over to the bad guys. Another province is handed over to the bad guys. Day after day, the situation was getting worse and worse. I became under a huge direct persecution. But the only thing that I was really afraid was they will torture me and kill me right before the eyes of my children, especially my daughters. We have 80,000 allies. People who completed their contract from serving as an interpreter or serving as an ally with us are going to be abandoned. I can't control political decisions that are being made, but I can make sure my friend Aziz wasn't left behind. Taliban fighters surround the capital, Kabul. They shut down Bagram Air Force Base without notifying anyone and made the single point of evacuation Hamid Karzai International Airport, HKIA, in Kabul, Afghanistan. Afghans are thronging to Kabul's airport. It's very hard to grasp the level of chaos on the ground at HKIA. Desperate to get on planes and leave the country at any cost. Tens of thousands of people were swarming that airport to get on those planes and get out. So the State Department treated the HKIA airport like an embassy. Anybody that would get into that airport is safe, but the military is never going to go outside the airport to get people. The Taliban controlled the outer perimeter. Anybody that wants to get to the airport could only do so by permission of the Taliban. So thousands of Americans are trapped on the outside the airport and don't know where to go. I knew we were going to have to go on the ground and get him made the decision to start putting together a small special operations team, former special operations veterans who would be willing to go help get specifically Aziz's wife and six kids. Yeah, so this picture is uh, you know, definitely bittersweet for me, myself, Aziz, and all, all these guys, other guys here, were former Northern Alliance fighters. Put them through a special training program and assigned them to our task force at JSOC. Of all these guys, who stood out most to me was Bashir, one of our, our Afghan operators. And in 2007, we had a compromise in our operation where someone ratted us out to the Taliban and compromised us. That person, unfortunately, was Bashir. We had 12 of our teammates captured and killed. That resulted also in a vehicle bomb being driven into my home. And then I was abducted by a foreign intelligence agency in a neighboring country because of this and held and, and heavily interrogated. And so our command went after Bashir and, and they caught him. But in 2011, President Obama did a massive prisoner release from, from Saudi Arabia and sent all these guys back to Afghanistan and was free. And Bashir was one of those. He went back to the Taliban. Aziz got word that a Bashir was specifically looking for him and some of our former teammates. And one of our former teammates was captured and killed, beheaded. So when we talk about the eminence and uh, the fear of Aziz's wife and six kids being killed, 
the eminence behind that was not just because Aziz was an interpreter, it was because of Bashir. We knew Bashir, a former teammate, was on a retaliation hunt. Let's help as many people as, as we can. One of our team members had a relationship with the royal family of the United Arab Emirates. We were able to facilitate a phone call with the royal family. Uh, Congresswoman Hartzler, uh, incredible lady. I got several members of Congress. We had a giant conference call and I briefed what we were gonna try to do. I'm waiting for the big fat no. And they said, we wanna help. We roll out the red carpet, bring them here to Abu Dhabi. We'll have our humanitarian center, we'll have doctors, we'll have food, we'll have lodging. In addition to that, we're going to give you a C-17 plane with pilots. He called me and he told me that he's in Washington, D.C., talking to some very high-ranked people. He said he's going to put a team together. And at the end, he told me, God loves you, man. You the earned American it. Still on the ground, 80,000 Afghans. The third day, this all happened in three days, by the way. Got under radio thinking I'd raise a few thousand dollars. Chad Robichaud, who's trying to get And at three-day period, them safely out. raised $21 million. Daniel called me from Abu Dhabi. He asked me, Aziz, my brother, you need to do me a recon around the Kabul airport, U.S. Embassy, because we will be in Kabul tomorrow morning. Took a lot of videos and pictures and made it like a presentation on PowerPoint. Send it to him the next morning they were there. Working directly with the military unit who's trying to get people out. We had a ground team go on the ground in H. Kaya to start doing evacuations. We have a plane landing right now. And for 10 days we start doing evacuations from the airport. The veterans are working around the clock to get thousands of Afghan allies and Americans out of the country with us now. They would send me a GPS location from the Kabul airport to follow that. Any minute there was a chance of a suicide bomb, IEDs. They took over the outer perimeter of the Kabul airport. They are standing with their guns, stopping people, checking documents, because they are looking for the people they want to capture and stop them. Once you pass the Taliban checkpoint, you have the Afghan Zero units trained by the CIA. They are used as a secondary security perimeter of the airport. Once you pass them, there is the U.S. Marines. The Taliban are shooting at me, the Zero units are shooting at me, then once I pass them, the, the Marines are not allowing me. It was a chaos. My wife, she's crying, my daughters are crying, my sons are afraid. We spent nights and days in the parking lots inside the taxi now because I cannot go back to my home because now it's captured by the bad guys. I was really scared, honestly. I was really nervous. Chad said no. He reminded me of who I was. He told me you're not quitting. You're coming through the Kabul airport. Stay right there. He said he's going to make some phone calls. He asked his guys to come and stand where all the Marines are. I parked the family like a couple of miles away from the crowd. I had to ask him to give me two of the zero unit guys so that we, now we can go to the Taliban area to bring my family. And that's how we did exactly. We had got Aziz on his eighth attempt. It was his eighth attempt to get through the airport. The PJ, and they came out the wire and was able to get Aziz inside the airport. 20 pounds of explosives on the bomb. A suicide bomber Survived. drove into the Abbey Gate, killed 13 of our service members, killed 160 others. The military was forced to weld the gate shut and evacuations ended. At that point, we had got 12,000 people out. We chose to stay for another two months. That ended with about 17,000 people out. Uh, all the thousands of people we have here is because, you know, we came to get him. And uh, he's actually already taken charge and in charge of the entire process. When he landed in Abu Dhabi, that's when I was, okay, I can breathe now. I went to the humanitarian center where he was, knocked on his door, and he answered the door. And just gave a big giant hug. Uh, you know, he's a big old dude, big old bear hug around me, and we both just started crying. After spending nine months, finally one day, Somebody came from the U.S. Embassy, asked me that now it's my time to go. Asking from my friends and probably from the CIA department, they found out who I was and then they issued the visa. And they get to Texas and they're in my driveway. I'm coming back from Ukraine, actually. I pull up and I see my dog running through my yard. I get out of my truck and I go to the front door and they're all there. And I give Aziz a big hug. And uh, that was kind of like a real full circle moment for me. 
Aziz wanted freedom for his daughters. He wanted his daughters to be able to be educated and, and have a job and be a journalist if they wanted, be a doctor if they wanted, be a teacher if they wanted. They wanted the same freedoms that we have in America and they fought for it. One of the most atrocious things I heard during the Afghan withdrawal is how could we still keep helping these people when they won't fight for themselves? 60,000 Afghan men and women died fighting for the freedom of Afghanistan. They fought for themselves and they died fighting for themselves, fighting for freedom. Now I'm here, I'm a Tigzin, and you know, my kids are going to school. They have all kinds of rights and freedoms. I serve as a cultural advisor for the Mighty Oaks Foundation, which helps the veterans who are struggling with PTSD. I'm really proud of what I did in Afghanistan, and it's worth it. Interpreters like Aziz, those allies who actually made it here, we could give them honor and dignity and respect for what they did for our country, for what they did for the cause of freedom, for their nation that they lost. And if they are going to be our neighbors, if they are going to be Americans, then we could help them, welcome them with open arms, and help them integrate in our society.